name is Henry Luyombia, and uh, just a brief about what we'll be doing in the next one and a half hours. We will have uh, presenters, and after the presentations, we'll have an open dialogue. We are hoping that each presenter will have at least eight to nine, or maybe 10 minutes, and then uh, we will have uh, a dialogue on uh, either questions or comments. But very importantly, one of the aims of this uh, uh, dialogue or webinar is to share the findings from uh, the Musafiri project, but also lay strategies on how to minimize people getting HIV upon their arrival in Canada, and also seeing how these uh, findings can be translated beyond uh, such an audience. Uh, so welcome to everyone again. So now I would like to introduce um, Wangari. Welcome, Wangari. There. So anyway, my name is uh, Wangari Karao, and I work at Women's Health in Women's Health Community Health Center. Uh, and I am presenting on behalf of the um, Safiri team. Uh, and after me, there's going to be a panel of speakers who are going to be talking about um, HIV within ACB populations from different uh, perspectives. Uh, I would like to start by first acknowledging um, the team that actually helped the implementation of the, of, of the Safiri project. Um, we had a, a really uh, a great team um, in, involving uh, community members, uh, service providers, and academic and community-based researchers. Uh, but I would like in particular to acknowledge uh, Dr. Robert Remis, uh, who actually helped facilitate the process of getting the funding uh, to implement this project. Uh, since I only have 10 minutes, I'm not going to be uh, focusing too much on a lot of the, uh, the background information. Uh, and on this slide, all I want to highlight is that until uh, recently, um, we didn't understand um, the, the context, the, we didn't have the numbers, uh, and the patterns of HIV infection uh, post-migration uh, for ACB populations. We all know ACB populations are highly impacted by HIV, uh, and we really do need to have very specific information uh, to help ta uh, develop targeted uh, HIV prevention programs. Um, the aim of the Safari project was to help characterize HIV acquisition in persons from Africa, the Caribbean, and Black populations uh, after they arrived in Canada. This was a multi-phase study. Uh, and phase one, we actually um, uh, looked at uh, an existing database, uh, the Ontario HIV um, cohort study, uh, the OHTN cohort study, um, and out of the approximately um, uh, 3,800 uh, persons registered within the cohort, uh, we identified 825 participants who qualified um, to participate in what we were hoping to do uh, in phase one of the study. Uh, and we wanted out of this uh, 825 to actually uh, figure out who was uh, infected uh, pre-migration who was infected post-migration. Um, and out of the 825, uh, we couldn't determine, uh, you know, about 50% we couldn't figure out when they were infected, uh, but we could determine that 34% were infected pre-migration and 17% were infected post-migration. Uh, and the 17% are the ones we were really interested in, uh, uh, in finding out how they actually got infected. So to be, you can get uh, in-depth analyses and findings from uh, phase one of the study by watching the webinar, uh, the first webinar, and you all got a link to that webinar. In phase two, uh, we had structured quantitative interviews and in-depth um, uh, qualitative interviews with a small sample uh, of the people infected post migration. We wanted to um, identify who was at greatest risk of acquiring HIV post migration. We wanted to understand the patterns of HIV acquisition um, post arrival, but also to understand the context within which people were actually getting HIV. 
And out of the group that we identified were infected post migration uh, within phase one, these are the people we wanted to recruit uh, from five sites in, uh, in Toronto where they actually access care. We had uh, five HIV uh, clinics participate in the study, four in Toronto and four in Ottawa. Uh, that the eligibility is listed there. But most importantly, they had to be identified as a black person with Caribbean or uh, Sub-Saharan African ancestry, uh, had a previous HIV negative test in Canada, or migrated before the age of 13. Um, so they had an engaging sex in the previous country, or those who were actually born here. Uh, and we recruited 108 participants for the quantitative interviews uh, and 44 participants for the qualitative interviews. Uh, a highlight of the summary is all um, of the findings is all I'm actually uh, providing here. And for phase one, um, a much larger proportion of those infected post arrival were actually uh, MSM or MSM IDU, 53%, 40% were heterosexual. Uh, and they were largely of Caribbean ancestry with a smaller proportion of African uh, ancestry. Those infected pre-arrival were mostly heterosexual, 87%, and 11% were MSM. Uh, and so you can see this is really changing our belief that uh, ACB people uh, acquire HIV within their own countries. Uh, and we usually have um, a very, uh, uh, it's basically a heterosexual, primarily a heterosexual epidemic, uh, but the post arrival is actually shattering this belief. Majority of those infected post arrival are actually MSM uh, at 53%. Uh, the general uh, findings, um, people tended to partner with others of the same ancestry. Um, however, we had a small uh, a proportion of about 44% who had a non-black a likely source partner. Uh, participants were overwhelmingly living in Canada when they were they were infected, and their partners were mostly living uh, living in Canada. Most infections were was relatively constant across the co cohorts. Injection drug use was rare, uh, and the mean years since diagnosis um, for those infected via injection drug use was about eighteen. Uh, 18 years. Few are likely to know their partner's HIV status, uh, and condom use was very inconsistent. Um, uh, for gay men, um, uh, major majority were of Caribbean uh, ancestry, uh, about 80%, according to the MSAFERI data. Uh, approximately 65% of gay men could identify uh, the likely source of their infection um, and the likely source partner for those who for those who identify who are able to identify 56 or regular partners but we also have a, a substantial um, infection from casual partners at 43 percent gay men were largely inconsistent in the use of condoms um, majority uh, of, of gay men also identified their um, their, their source partners as, um, uh, as, 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 uh, as non-black. Uh, in terms of the heterosexual women, uh, they were more likely to be able to identify the source of their infection at 82%. Uh, and the person who was likely the source of infection was actually a regular partner at 91%. Um, and few of the women knew the status of their uh, um, uh, few, um, few knew their partner's HIV status at the time of infection, uh, and for, for, for women, 96% did not know their partner's HIV status, compared to 87% of straight men and 83% of gay men. Uh, they were also very, very uh, inconsistent in their use of condoms. 60% of women never used condoms, 24% used condoms some of the time, and only 16% always used condoms. Uh, they were significantly more likely to never use condoms compared to gay men. Um, uh, and the most common reason for not using condoms was that their partner did not like to use condoms. In terms of heterosexual men, um, for who identify a likely source partner, it was likely their regular partner. 
heterosexual men were also more likely to have white uh, sexual partners at 57% or other race partners at 15% um, than black partners. Only 29% had uh, black partners. Uh, straight men were largely inconsistent in their condom use, just like women and gay men. 44% never used condoms, 56% used condoms some of the time, and none always used condoms. Uh, and the most common reason for them not using condoms was that, they, that um, they did not like to use condoms themselves at 15%, uh, or they thought their partner was actually low risk. Uh, based on the uh, qualitative uh, data, remember we had um, uh, quantitative, uh, qualitative um, interviews with about 44 uh, participants. Uh, ACB men and women infected in Canada uh, are heterogeneous. Um, the pathway to HIV acquisition is set in an environment of cultural loss, social and economic vulnerability, and an equal distribution of power on account of race, gender, uh, and social capital. Immigration uh, immigration and challenges with integration uh, into a very racialized society may actually uh, uh, increase their risk uh, of HIV uh, transmission. Well, now uh, you have about a minute to, to sort of wrap up. Yes, I'm wrapping up now. Implications, prevention strategies yeah. should address the distinct inequities, risk perceptions, and practices of men and women from African Caribbean um, communities uh, and the unique drivers of HIV uh, for those who have moved from uh, countries with generalized epidemics to countries with uh, uh, perceivably uh, lower risk. Uh, and thank you very much. If I went over time, I am um, my apologies. Thank you very much. Actually, you had about 10 seconds left uh, for the 10 minutes. Thank All you right. very much, uh, Wangari, for that comprehensive presentation in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Henry. <clears throat> um, I, I just have a few slides, and I'm not going to be speaking about anything that we haven't, that, that nobody knows or that we haven't necessarily thought about before. But it is just uh, something that I feel that uh, we need to emphasize at this stage in, in, the, in the epidemic. So, you know, a lot of what Wangari talked about was uh, about risk, about who is using condoms and, and, and who's not using condoms and, and so on. And I, and I think most people understand, uh, understand this by now, that, you know, there are certain uh, behaviors that might uh, increase or reduce your chances of getting or transmitting HIV. And, and so things like using condoms, who's on PrEP, saying no, negotiating safer sex, reducing the number of sexual partners, all of these things are, are, are good things. They're a repertoire of good behaviors, if you will, that I think we all understand, at least intellectually. It doesn't mean, of course, that, that anybody all the time is, is able to manage these in their own personal behaviors, but at least we understand this uh, intellectually. And, um, you know, these kinds of things or doing these things, uh, uh, using condoms and so on, will reduce one's chances of getting or transmitting uh, HIV and uh, STIs. So if we step back a little bit from that, uh, then we can talk about uh, our vulnerability to HIV. So for populations that are so massively affected by HIV, it is really unlikely that, um, you know, it, it, it is entirely or even mostly because people do not understand their individual risk or people just behave badly um, or people are ignorant or whatever, however you might choose to, to understand uh, not appreciating risk and not doing the things that we pointed out in the, in the, first, in the first slide. So here is where we have to engage with the, the syst systemic or structural factors that promote or undermine our health. And this is not specific to HIV. This is about our, our ability to really um, engage with our health and to engage our colleagues and counterparts in our, in our networks and in black communities uh, about our health. So it's, it's not specific to HIV, 
but of course HIV is part of what we're talking about. Now you, you, you may also know of course that HIV is not the only health condition uh, where uh, black people in uh, Canada have an, uh, where the, the prevalence among black people in Canada is elevated. There, there are others as well. So it's not just about HIV, but certainly HIV is an important one. So what are our sources of disadvantage? Uh, that's in, in the box on the left. Uh, we can talk about social uh, oppression, anti-black racism, unfair treatment, and, and so on. And those things, according to the, the sort of the way I've sketched this out, uh, diminish our access to resources for living. So um, our ability um, to look after our material well-being in terms of having a job and, uh, and having adequate income and so on. Our ability to, uh, to, be, to be educated, to fulfill the educational requirements that we need to move on and to succeed in this society. Our ability to, uh, to, to have uh, appropriate or adequate uh, shelter, to live in environments which are healthy. And this is not only healthy in, the terms, of, in terms of, you know, what, what, what people usually call, um, think of when they speak of the environment, like, I don't know, living near a dump or, or garbage or, or so on. But it includes environments, of course, that are free of violence and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, our access to recreation and also our ability um, to feed ourselves um, a, a, a appropriately. So if, 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 if our sources of disadvantage diminish our access to those resources for living, then over the long term, our health will be undermined. We will, we will, we will not have access to the wherewithal to maintain uh, health as, 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 as we should. So I've listed a number of um, uh, different conditions there. And, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who know about uh, who know a little bit more about women's health, for example, you will know that it's, it, it, uh, of course, it has an important HIV program, but there are lots of other things that women's health does as well. And this, this speaks to some of the things in, in that box, for example. So then, so in my mind, uh, how does this work? So we have this sort of, these structural, um, um, disadvantages or, or this uh, sources of structural disadvantage which diminish our access to resources for living. It, it also means that, and this is not necessarily linear in the way we have it here, but I couldn't sort of think outside the box, so to speak, how to, how to represent this. But it also means that our, 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 our ability to, to, to express self-determination is uh, suppressed as well. So we become unable to make the kinds of choices both individually in terms of now at the individual level some people might call that agency but at the community level we might call it self-determination or community self-determination. So we're unable to make the kinds of life enhancing choices that we are aware of already. It isn't as though we don't uh, know what we should do uh, to, 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 to sort of maintain our health. Or, or to improve our health. Of course, we know by and large, but in many cases, we are unable to because other things get in the way. There are other priorities uh, that, that, that get in the way. Or we are dealing with other things that, um, you know, uh, prevent us from making the kinds of choices uh, that, that we make. And, and, and then at the, end of this, at the end of this long line, this train, if you will, is risky behavior. So then intervening only at risky behaviors is not enough. We have to go upstream and intervene upstream so that, so that we, can, we can help to, to change risky behaviors downstream. Of, of course, we can intervene at the level of risky behaviors. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about using condoms and so on. Uh, of course, th this, is, this is important. And it's, it's things that we ought to be talking about or practicing or, or whatever. But that is, that is not enough. We must also intervene upstream and look at the, uh, the systemic disadvantage as well. That means, in our case, in the case of uh, African Canadians, talking about anti-Black racism and, and, really, and really making this um, really central to the way how we think about uh, health and well-being. Not just about HIV, but about health and well-being. 
so as individuals, of course, we, you know, we, we have certain gifts and, and certain resources as, as, as individuals. Um, you know, we can sort of do things, we can make things happen for ourselves individually. So we get informed, you can, you can, you know, get informed, uh, use the information that's already available. And we can think of our behaviors or practices and, and our beliefs and, and determine, well, are these things good for us? Or will these things be causing us harm? So we have that individual responsibility. But, but that is only part of the issue. We also have a collective responsibility because we're not just here as individuals. And you know, a society is not just a group of individuals. It's, it's more than that because we have to think of a society in terms not only as, as individuals, but of the relationships between those people as well. So we also have to think collectively about how do we create enabling conditions or conditions that enable people to be able to talk about risk, to be able to critically assess their risk and so on. So we must, we must create a condition where, where people feel empowered, if you will. I don't like using that word, but let me use it anyway. Where people feel empowered to have certain kinds of thoughts, certain kinds of conversations in their community. And those things, are, those conversations and those ways of thinking are not considered to be sort of, um, you know, they're not considered to be uh, useless or, or outside of what we should be talking about. But in addition to that, we also have to organize, resist, and advocate. Is my time up? You have about five seconds. Okay. In addition to that, you know, cre those, creating those conditions will also help us to do something. It will also help us to organize, to resist, and to advocate for the things that we want, for the things that we need, that will um, sort of put us over the hump, if you will, that will enable us, that will help us and enable, it, and enable us to make the kinds of decisions and choices individually, but also as a community, that we need to make in our own best interest. Note that, in our own best interest. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Winston, uh, for again uh, giving us a look at the individual as well as uh, uh, structural issues. Um, uh, I'm now going to invite uh, the next presenter, Wesley. The floor is yours. You mean the screen is yours? The screen. Okay, wonderful. Can uh, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so this is really going to be, uh, you know, more or less uh, a summary, a concise summary of the uh, initial presentation that I delivered in February. But I tried to do something slightly different in, in a provocative way. And I'm using the language here, refusing strategies, mm. strategies for refusing what we think we know about the epidemic. And by refusing, this playful language is meant to sort of evoke this idea that we must refuse what has been refused to us already. Dignity, good health, mobility, and life. We are refusing those things that systems deny us. We refuse to accept that migrant populations, particularly black populations that enter Canada, generally enter in fairly good health, but over time, their health declines, right? So I'm gonna make a, a very simple argument today, um, that the HIV epidemic is structured not by the deviant behaviors or relations that people engage in, and by this I'm talking about black people, I'm talking about migrants, I'm talking about newcomers, uh, newcomer immigrants, Right? So it's not the, the risky things that they do, it's not the bad things that they do, but by the unequal and violent conditions in which they are forced to live, and that's key, forced to live. We do not choose to live in violence, and that are embodied as ill health and vulnerability to disease. And so what I'm saying here is that the real problem isn't how much, with whom, or what kinds of sex black people are having, newcomers or immigrants, the problem is that black people's vulnerability is independent of the behaviors that enable the transmission of the virus. Now, what do I mean by that? 
I mean that black people's experience of vulnerability to HIV is not or is irreducible to the numbers of HIV transmission, transmitting acts, the number of sexual partners, or the number of concurrent sexual relations. So I'm saying it's, vulnerability is not necessarily what we do, but vulnerability emerges from somewhere else. And conceptually, for me, that emerges uh, with the enslavement of Africans, racial slavery, the objectification of the slave, which strips Africans of their humanity and subjecthood. So what I'm saying is that as Africans, as black people enter this world as slaves, right, their vulnerability is already configured. That what we are experiencing as black people in society, right, is not accidental, right? It is the product of a system of inequality that has used race and ideas and notions of blackness to subjugate. So what are these strategies that I'm proposing here? And yes, they're conceptual, they're provocative, uh, but they do have practical implications for how we understand and conceptualize HIV prevention in our community. Strategy one, which is quite simple, let's politicize black health, right? We refuse color blindness. And so this is to say that disease disparities among black populations are not accidental. This is not to say that HIV is a plot or conspiracy to eliminate black people, that's different. But what we're saying is that the social location that black people find themselves in, right, put them at risk for HIV. It also means that we cannot speak in, general, in generalities. We cannot just simply talk of um, risk. We can't simply talk of gay men. We can't simply talk of uh, behaviors without sort of contextualizing what this means in the case of, of black folks. The so strategy two, uh, I think we need to ground our work in the collective interests and needs of black communities in some ways to refuse prevention frameworks based on individualized risk. And here the idea is that uh, we cannot be, or black folks cannot simply be one giant calculus of individuals outside of the political. And, and what happens when we focus on individuals is that in some ways we shift attention away from uh, the structures. So we're blaming individuals for the things that they do as opposed to trying to understand the conditions that sort of limit people or limit their options in terms of how they respond and experience the world, how they experience sex, for example. And the third strategy, the social determinants of health, making sure that when we think about HIV disparities, that we're thinking of these disparities in relation to a set of other health disparities that black folks experience, but that we're also thinking about things like uh, income insecurity, uh, food insecurity, um, social mobility of black people. Uh, we're thinking about educational pathways. How do these things sort of come together to produce particular kinds of outcomes, right? Um, so making sure that as we think of newcomers and immigrants, uh, we make sure that we, in our prevention work, we make sure that the social determinants of health are, are centered. And that'll be all for me. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about HIV prevention programming uh, and assumptions uh, around HIV prevention for heterosexual ACB women. Um, just a little bit of background. I work at Women's Health and Women's Hands as the community health worker there. So just some background information. Um, a host of factors are implicated in the reduced and lower rates of HIV testing in ACB communities in Canada and ACB women's increased vulnerability to HIV infection are tied to social and structural inequities that extend far beyond factors related to immigration status, sim uh, similar to what Wesley just touched on. Um, and we find that there's also been a general perception of low risk and lower understanding of one's risk acquiring, to, uh, acquiring and transmitting HIV 
among our population, making HIV testing and prevention a low priority. Um, and there is often been studies that show there's also a limited knowledge and awareness of community-based interventions and programs. Um, and ACB women have been disproportionate, disproportionately uh, encountering HIV-related stigma, gender discrimination, and racial discrimination, which are major barriers to access and uptake of HIV testing and prevention services. So many of these factors are assumptions that are echoed um, by ACB women in the community. And um, as part of the development of our project at Women's Health and Women's Hands, entitled ACB Women Know Your Status, HIV Prevention Project, we hosted a focus group, or we hosted uh, several focus groups with community members and service providers and asked them to share their opinions on HIV prevention within the community for ACB women. Various themes emerged and I will share with you a few direct quotes that came from our participants. So one of the themes that emerged in our conversations was a theme around stigma, um, particularly in terms of fear and disclosure. Uh, and this one participant um, shared with us that she felt that stigma instills fear. Uh, and mostly women are afraid, you, uh, afraid of possibly disclosing their HIV status because sometimes it leads to violence. Another theme that emerged um, is the one associated with stigma among religious and faith communities. This Christian pastor, pastor shared with us that denial has been encountered, creating a tension between faith, um, between faith and living with HIV. And with that, there could be a refusal to claim or accept that, they, uh, that one would be HIV positive uh, because they look at that as lacking faith. So that's something we have to consider when talking about um, HIV prevention in our community. We also found that a lack, a lack of knowledge and awareness around HIV in Canada emerged as well. This individual immigrated um, here from um, Uganda and encountered differences between public awareness of HIV in Canada and back home, which is something that also influences low risk perception as mentioned earlier. Experiencing discrimination and lack of trust in the community in the Canadian healthcare system was also evident in our discussions. This individual here acknowledged that she would rather keep to herself than have health care providers pass judgment on her without knowing her experiences. And also, uh, finally, the lack of access is something that came up in our discussions as well, uh, especially lack of access for youth. This youth addressed that drop-in hours were not accessible, and with that, HIV testing becomes less of a priority or accessing HIV prevention um, resources doesn't become a priority if they don't, they don't have the time to access or they have no um, you know, transportation to, to get to their location and so forth. So access is definitely something we have to consider. So how do we alleviate some of these issues that have been discussed through community dialogue and the Misafiri study findings and increase access to resources, HIV awareness and prevention among ACB women? As a service provider with Women's Health and Women's Hands, our goal is to address these issues through our extensive programming. And currently at Women's Health and Women's Hands, our program, our HIV program is integrated within a larger health framework, uh, taking into account ACB women's lived experiences and challenges. Our programs include prevention and education, diagnoses, treatment, and long-term support and care. And the aim of our two prevention projects seen in front of you uh, is meant to alleviate some of these issues around uh, relation to access by reducing stigma, discrimination through community educational workshops, and outreach at cultural festivals and gatherings, and thus optimize HIV testing as prevention. Through these projects, we've been able to reach over 7,000 women through outreach and education, and within the last two years, over 300 plus women have accessed point of care testing and resources. Um, we've been able to access settings such as community spaces where women congregate, which is Afrofest, Pride, universities, colleges, faith groups, settlement agencies, and so forth. So where do we go from here? The Mistafiri study data played a key role in our future program planning um, because it really 
creates a new starting point for us. It sheds light on information that ceased to exist or was very limited for the HCB migrant population. So to move forward and build upon existing programming for ACB heterosexual women, I propose these four recommendations. One, there must be better psychological and social support for women who test positive during the immigration process. In our line of work, we have often heard women share their experiences of finding out their HIV status through immigration and then not being provided with adequate support. We have to work with these governing bodies to ensure that the methods that they use are trauma aware, trauma informed, and that they can provide the resources and support that women need upon finding out their status and looking to thrive in a new country. Number two, I, I believe we should have our prevention strategies must be uh, more culturally relevant. It, the ACB population is very diverse and therefore we cannot group Africans, Caribbeans and black folks under one umbrella and expect one strategy to work for all groups. Africans and Caribbeans are different culture, come from different cultures uh, with different experiences and knowledge around HIV and our initiatives must take that into consideration and be culturally appropriate. Third, we must address power dynamics in relationships and women's precarious status. We find in the study that the main reasons why women did not report using condoms was not because they did not want to, but because their partner did not like using condoms or out of fear of losing their relationship. Our prevention strategies for heterosexual women must not only focus on educating women, but for lack of a better word, empowering women uh, so that they are more in control of their sexual relationships and can negotiate safer sex and educate their partners. And finally, I believe that we should engage more faith leaders to challenge the stigma and assumptions around HIV. Uh, in our communities, faith and spirituality and religion are really strong supports for ACB people. So we need to work with faith leaders and engage them more to create safe space to challenge the stigma around HIV with their congregations and create designated spaces for women to have these discussions. Um, personally, with these, three, with these four strategies, it's my hope that we can make a significant improvement to prevention strategies for ACB heterosexual women post-migration. Um, and with that, that's everything that I have to share. Thank you. So my name is Garfield Durant. I'm the Men Who Have Sex With Men Prevention Coordinator with the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention, Black CAP. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, understanding the HIV prevention needs of Black MSMs in Toronto. Uh, before I get into uh, to the, the whole dialogue around the HIV prevention needs for Black MSMs, I just want to talk a little bit about Black CAP. So uh, Black CAP was founded in 1989. Uh, and we, Black Cap has really worked to meet its mission in our Black communities. Uh, part of its mission is to reduce the spread of HIV and <clears throat> HIV infection within Toronto Black communities and to also enhance the quality of life of Black people living with HIV or affected by HIV or AIDS. Um, our work is also guided by our motto, uh, because all Black people's lives are important. And it stands as a reminder of the importance of our commitment to our community. So are Black MSMs at risk for HIV? So we know that men who have sex with men are not a single homologous group, but represent a wide variety of people, lifestyle, and health needs. Uh, from middle-class gay men to homeless runaways to injection drug users, that is IDUs, to incarcerated men, MSM have different identities and associated risk for HIV and other infectious diseases. MSM refers to any man who has sex with a man, whether identif identifies as, as gay, bisexual, or heterosexual. Despite the success in changing sexual behaviors, MSM continued to be dispro disproportionately affected by HIV within our community. Migration is a strong determinant of health, and uh, a large cohort of Black MSM refugees rep report challenges in accessing healthcare based on immigration status. We also know about uh, recognizing that about 40% 40, 40 of Black MSMs have experienced an STI, that's a sexually transmitted infection, and in, a, in, in their lifetime, and in about one-fifth um, in Toronto self-reported living with HIV. And that's based on some uh, research that has been done over the past five years. 
So why do black MSM take risk? Well, unfortunately, there's no simple answer to this question. HIV is not, a simple, is not an issue that exists by itself, but is woven into many aspects of men's lives. The explanation of, for unsafe sex are complex and multifaceted. Many black MSM struggle with individual, interpersonal, and societal stressors that may interfere with their ability to protect themselves. And individual factors can lead to unsafe sex, such as feeling invulnerable to HIV, having high levels of optimism about HIV antiviral medications, perceiving that unsafe sex is more pleasurable than safer sex, and being depressed or sad, having conflicting allegiance with either their racial or sexual identity, and using alcohol or other drugs, ex especially marijuana, crystal meth, and poppers. For the interpersonal motivations, it could be more pressing, wanting to fit in, to find companionship and intimacy. However, interpersonal issues can also contribute to unsafe sex, such as finding it difficult to communicate or negotiate safer sex with a sexual partner. Black MSM who are in a relationship are more likely to have unsafe sex than single Black MSM. As part of the societal factors uh, that influence the taking of MSM, of black MSMs. Many black MSMs find themselves isolated or rejected by traditional sources of support like family, school, or religious communities. Homophobia, racism, and poverty also place black MSM at risk. Some black MSM, especially those living on the street, are struggling with daily needs like avoiding violence, finding a place to live, or, or obtaining food. These pressing needs may overshadow the concern for safer sex and injection practices. There is almost no same, ge same gender sexuality ex education exists in our communities. Uh, like many teenagers, young MSM may only learn about sex through distorted media of pornographic or pornographic images. In general, men in today's society are pressured to prove their manhood through sexual activity and aggressiveness while women receive messages on moderation and care caretaking. Given this, many men at MSM may face additional challenges learning about dating, intimacy, and forming relationships about, about desire, sexual functioning, and arousal. Discomfort with one's sexuality and identity can lead to sexual risk-taking. HIV prevention programs must be informed by all of these elements. We also know that um, as part of uh, the risks that Black MSMs take, so social and cultural factors may also limit their ability to protect themselves from HIV. Black MSMs have few public spaces to meet each other. Gay bars, bathhouses, online networks, and public cruising areas are some of the more visible and accessible places offering an amenity for men exploring their sexual identity. These venues are also highly risk-taking. Uh, they're, they're highly sex-charged, and the bar scene's emphasis on alcohol sets the stage for engaging in sex while intoxicated. Substance use can also serve as a trigger or an excuse for unprotected sex. Some Black MSMs have trouble having sex without getting high first. Others prefer having sex while high, believing recreational drugs increase their libido. For some Black MSMs, drug use provides a sense of community and bonding at gay clubs and circuit parties. For many Black MSM IDUs, drug use, rather than sexual orientation, forms their personal identity. Many Black MSMs IDUs identify as heterosexual, and too often Black MSM IDUs are missed in prevention programs that target Black MSMs but leave out IDUs or programs that target IDUs but don't address sexual orientation. Black MSM IDUs have high rates of HIV infection, high frequency of unprotected sex, and high rates of poverty, addiction, and its related social and physical ills. The perception of sexual risk for HIV varies among Black MSM and may change from one sexual situation to another. Throughout the HIV epidemic, Black MSMs have in, engaged in sophisticated decision-making about the way they consider to be risky. Some men decide for themselves it's okay to not use a condom if they are the top, which is the insertive partner, 
or if they're having oral sex or if their or their partner's viral load is undetectable. Black MSMs may make these decisions because the scientific evidence of HIV risk is cloudy or simply because they are uncomfortable they're comfortable with levels with some levels of these risks. The literature on this topic is clear that an individual risk of HIV transmission is complex and depends on a number of behavioral and biological cofactors. It remains difficult, however, to accurately quantify the risk of transmission associated with specific acts. Very little is known about the effect of viral load on the risk of transmission for men who have sex with men and for injection drug users. Black MSM have engaged in a hierarchy of strategies for maintaining safer sex that are fluid and, code and context dependent. Most Black MSMs are able to manage sexual risk with effective strategies such as monogamy with concordant partners, consistent condom use with repeated testing, condom use outside of relationship or abstinence. We know that unprotected anal intercourse between an HIV positive and an HIV negative man remains the greatest risk for HIV transmission among Black MSM. This has proven to be the biggest challenge for HIV prevention. The intimacy of skin-to-skin -skin contact during intercourse may be a powerful and important draw. Many Black MSMs feel their sexual identity, as well as the hard-on goal of gay sexual liberation, are based on having sex, including anal intercourse, in a free and unstricted manner. Sorry, free and unconstricted manner. Uh, little is known about the internet's role in these men's lives. Uh, including how Black MSM use the internet to obtain social support, make new friends, and find romantic partners, and or cruise for sex. So what has been done? So we know that uh, very little is done outside of Black Caps and APA's, the African Caribbean Partnership Against AIDS, APA's work within the Black community. Uh, we know that social isolation can be particularly difficult, challenging, challenging for um, the Black MSMs, especially in communities where LGBTQ, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people are not as visible. So Black Cap discussions or activity groups. So a number of the groups that Black Cap and APA have coordinated in the community um, has really been helpful in strengthening the work in supporting and creating community as part of the, the network of Black MSM. Groups such as Socialite 411, which is a bi-weekly drop-in peer support group for Black MSMs, ranging from age 16 to 29 years old. Uh, we have Pepperpot, which is a monthly drop-in peer support group for Black MSMs over 29 years old. Uh, we have QPod, a monthly peer support group for Black MSMs of all ages living with HIV. Uh, and we have the behavioral interventions, such as the Many Men, Many Voices, which is a group level HIV prevention intervention. Uh, the recently delivered Affirm intervention, an affirmative cognitive behavioral group intervention, and uh, some, online, some resources that Black have has also been strong in terms of development and around support for Black MSM. So we have the, uh, the My Black is Healthy, which is an online resource which is aimed to address the health and wellness needs of Black MSM in Toronto. And the, the work that we have done with the Gay Men Sexual Health Alliance the, around the sex you want, which is a campaign aimed at getting cisgendered and transgender gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men, preventing, testing and treating HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. So, what else needs to, to happen? So we know that there is an urgent need to create prevention and wellness programs specifically for Black MSMs. We know that we need to ensure that there's a direct involvement of Black MSM in the planning and implementation of these programs. Special attention is needed to reach marginalized Black MSMs, such as those who are homeless, engaged in commercial sex work, or involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, ex so we also want to know that uh, existing program for older Black MSMs should also be accessible to younger Black MSMs. And these programs should also address the issue of sexuality, gay identity, cultural, ethnicity, 
racism, homophobia, homophobia, poverty, violence, and trauma. Uh, so these are my uh, recommended strategies, uh, really, to develop a research and program sci science agenda for BMSMs, uh, implementing more interventions uh, specific around faith-based IDUs and mental health supports for Black MSMs. Um, so I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, HIV surveillance uh, here in, uh, in Ontario. I'm the Director of Data and Applied Science at the OHTN, um, and I'm also the Principal Investigator now for the OHTN Cohort Study, which Wangari mentioned earlier. Um, so when we, when we look at HIV surveillance, uh, there are several different data sources that we use. Uh, the main source that I'm going to talk about is laboratory data. So these are the, um, the results of laboratory tests that are done as part of clinical practice. Um, there's also public health surveillance data collected by the public health units around Ontario. There's, of course, clinic and pharmacy data, administrative health services data, such as the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, or ISIS. There's cross-sectional surveys that are done, um, such as the SexNow survey, cohort studies, such as the OHTN cohort study, modeling estimates, and then vital statistics, such as death records. Um, I'm gonna, we particularly in Ontario use the laboratory data. That's not true in every province in Canada or every jurisdiction in the world, um, but we're limited by what's collected on the laboratory forms to inf inform our surveillance. So when we look at surveillance data, um, there was no race ethnicity data collected on the test requisition form until 2018. And on new diagnoses, about 25% are missing information on risk factors, and about 40% are missing information on ethnicity. Um, and that has only been captured since 2009. So we have to make the assumption that the missingness is random on these different forms so that it, we can understand what's going on within subpopulations. But the fact that these forms aren't filled out completely um, does influence our ability to make interpretations. Um, often, you know, people are doing a clinical test and I've actually heard from physicians already with the new text requisition form that patients are asking, you know, why do you need to know my race to give me an HIV test? Um, so we ha do have to have some education of providers and of the public for why this information is important. The other challenge that we have in Ontario is how we've historically de defined a new diagnosis. So a new diagnosis was considered having a first positive HIV test in Ontario. So of course that's not the same thing as new infection. It includes people who already had HIV, who already had di diagnosed HIV, and then moved to Ontario and tested for the first time in Ontario. Um, it also includes people who may have been infected for many years, both in Ontario or outside Ontario, but weren't diagnosed until later. So you can imagine for a study like the M. Safiri study, you can see why we've had some maybe incorrect interpretations of diagnoses um, over time because our definition has, not, has included uh, new immigrants bring, who have HIV already um, as a new diagnosis to Ontario. So when we look at the new diagnoses, you can see um, they dropped slightly from 2007 to 2011 um, in the pre previous five years, uh, but those new diagnoses numbers um, are slightly higher in 2016. Um, the 2017 data is currently being analyzed um, and I can tell you we don't have uh, this information out to the public yet, but when we're looking at, we're finally breaking it down so that we're not including um, people who were diagnosed prior to moving to Ontario as part of our new um, diagnosis counts. And we do that, the numbers seem like they're actually leveling off um, and not increasing for new infections. When we look at diagnoses by sex, you can see that that relationship has been fairly stable over time. So around 20% of new diagnoses are women. Um, so that amounted to about 177 women in 2016 compared to around 700 men. When we look by age and sex in Ontario, you can see that the distribution is slightly different when you compare males and females. Um, in that you can see that males have a peak both at in a younger category, so looking at 25 to 29, there's a slight peak there, um, and, or a larger peak there, and then a slight peak later in life around 50 to 54, whereas the um, women follow a more what's considered a normal distribution with a peak in around middle age from about 30 to 40. Um, another thing that's important to note here is that you can't, um, 
assume that these are directly related to infection. So people um, can be infected for a few years. So um, I think the average is around three years before um, diagnosis. And that is different between different populations. So women have been known to have a later diagnosis than, um, than men on average, but uh, heterosexual men also have later diagnosis than MSM. So when we look at the percent of HIV diagnoses where known by priority population, you can see that there's uh, been um, a, a, a slight trend over time. So this is comparing years are aggregated so that we can uh, better um, have better understanding or confidence in the data. So we're comparing in the light blue bar, 2011 to 2012. And then in the darkest blue bar here, it's the years 2015 to 2016. And this is of course where the data is collected. You can see that Compared to 2011 and 2015, the percent of ACB was slightly declined. The percent of GBMSM is fairly stable, but slightly lower in 15, 16 compared to 14, 13. Um, but you can also see that here among people who use injection drugs, there's been a steady increase since 2011. When we look of the percent of HIV diagnosis by a priority population within ACB, you can see that the GBMSM numbers were higher in 2014-15, so we didn't include the 2016 data in this study, um, fortunately, um, it wasn't available, but they're slightly higher in 2015 among GBMSM than in 2010. So the, all of this data comes from the Public Health Ontario Laboratory, and they conduct all HIV diagnostic and viral load testing for the province. And that data is then combined into what's called the HIV Data Mart, where we can look at um, a single individual. So comparing someone's diagnostic results to their viral load results over time. And using that, we created a cohort of diagnosed people to measure over time. So only one other province in Canada has similar data, which is uh, British Columbia. And you can imagine that there are challenges since we didn't have data on race ethnicity prior to 2009. Um, it's hard for us to know what's going on with the entire population of ACB, because if you were diagnosed prior to 2009, then we don't actually know what your race ethnicity is today. Um, and that's probably about half of the population living with HIV in Ontario was diagnosed prior to, 20, to 2009. So when we look at um, the proportion of people living with HIV who are engaged in the care cascade, you can see that it has improved over time um, and for some indicators quite significantly. So the dark blue bar is the percent in care, which was slightly over 80% in 2000. And in 2015, it was 87%. Um, so that has had a slight increase, but where we really see the, the larger increases are the percent of people who are taking antiretroviral therapy, which increased from around 55 to 80 percent over 80 percent in 2015 and the correspondingly the percent of people who are virally suppressed so in 2000 it was only 40 percent and then you look at 2015 and it's almost 80 percent so these indicators have improved really significantly the challenge is that we haven't we aren't really able to break it down by priority population as well as we would like to but we do expect based on other um, studies that these differ by different populations and actually we do have this broken down by age categories and gender um, online and you can see that women uh, tend to do uh, not as well in the cascade as men uh, and that younger age groups also tend to not do as well. We used our cohort study to look at factors that were associated with lower engagement in care and as I stated in the laboratory data we saw here as well that youth tended to have lower engagement and women tended to have lower engagement. Um, in addition, people who are Canadian born, people who are indigenous, people of lower income, people who lack employer drug coverage, people who lack social support, those with mental health concerns, and those with substance and alcohol use concerns. So this is a, um, tells us more about who's having trouble engaging in the cascade. And I think there's more work to be done here, specifically looking when, within the ACB population um, and looking at uh, heterosexual men uh, within this population as well, because we also see that they are not as well engaged in the cascade. <laughs>
I know this is rather quick, um, but I think that there are some really important strategies to reduce post-migration infection when we consider surveillance data and how we're monitoring the epidemic in Ontario. First is that we should ensure that surveillance data reflects local transmission as well as imported cases. And as I mentioned before, this is something that we've been working on. Um, and I expect that our next, uh, the next time we, we release our data, we'll have that broken down so it better reflects new infections. Uh, we need to improve our data collections so that surveillance data reflects the population populations at risk in Ontario, so making sure that the right of the data is collected on the forms and that those forms are completed as well as possible. And I think that the whole point of gathering this information is really so that we can educate newcomers on the risk of HIV transmission, so that people are aware that HIV is a problem in Ontario and that they should um, be prepared to protect themselves. And focusing on the full cascade of care for people at risk, which includes PrEP, testing, linkage to care, and access to ARTs for all people in Ontario. I need to acknowledge all my partners, especially those who produced the, the data and the analysis for these reports from Public Health Ontario Labs and James Wilton. Um, and uh, if you're interested in seeing our reports as they come up, please join our mailing list at www.oeasy.ca or email me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail, our last presenter panelist this afternoon. And thank you to Winston, Wangari, Denise, Garfield, and Wellesley. So right now we have uh, uh, about 15 or 16 minutes. I will invite my colleague uh, Katesi to help co-moderate this session. We had some technical difficulty from this end. So I would uh, very much appreciate if we do this together. Katesi. You could please take over uh, starting the discussion. Okay, so we have a question from Sandra. Can Garfield cover his last slide? So uh, Garfield had to cut his presentation short because of time. So Garfield, um, would it be possible for you to share your screen again and go back to your presentation and finish off your recommendations? Thank you. So as part of my, uh, the recommendations uh, or strategies that I've outlined, uh, my four strategies, uh, one would be to develop an HIV prevention research agenda for Black NSMs, um, and the outcomes will inform future research and be used to advocate for com combination approaches to HIV prevention for Black MSMs. Um, the Black Church can provide guidance on HIV prevention education and can set an example by addressing and destigmatizing homophobia, substance use, and serophobia. Uh, we know that HIV prevention agencies must acknowledge underlying cultural and social factors in the Black community. And so programs need to address issues of employment, education, in incarceration, addiction, and stigma, in addition to sexual and drug risk behaviors. Um, Black MSMs were less likely to be the early adopters for PrEP. So given the array of social and structural barriers that may prevent these communities from accessing PrEP, example, through discrimination, family rejection, lack of stable housing, unemployment, prohibitive migration policies, targeted strategies are needed to increase PrEP uptake and take these barriers into account. And that's the end of uh, my strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Garfield. Winston has a comment or a response? This is a question really. Um, I, I think one of the things that Wangari um, had, uh, one of her slides said something like 16% of the people say they use condoms all the time, always, uh, but, but they're living with HIV. I, I'm not quite sure what that means because whether that means that they're using condoms always or all the time after their diagnosis or or before and if, if it was before how does that um, influence the sort of you know standard prevention message about using using condoms oh this is one guy i i guess uh the question is meant for myself libiana and sandy as the um the people that are involved in the uh, in the Msafiri project who are on the webinar. Uh, I think we were, we were looking at the context um, when people got infected and what was happening in their lives and what they were doing at the time. 
Uh, and at that time, that when they were they were asked the questions, they were asked, you know, and answered uh, based on um, um, how they got infected and when they got infected. Um, they had to be able to identify um, the like the 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 person who was their likely source of infection and talk about that context uh, in relation to the questions you're asking, Winston. Liviana, you have something else to add? Sorry, yeah, this is Sandy. Um, I just wanted to add that both people who could, I'd, people who could identify their likely source partner were asked about sex with that person at the time they were infected, um, a, as you indicated. Um, Wangari, people who could not identify their likely source of infection were asked about what was happening during the period during which they thought they were infected. So um, were they using condoms and the various types of um, sex that they had with the various types of partners um, they had? So it was all about leading up to their infection, whether it was the period in which they thought they were um, infected or the person with whom they thought they were infected from. Okay, so there's a, a follow-up question for Wangari here about female condoms. So John from Ottawa U asks, were female condoms considered in the study and how important is it to make female condoms part of the discussion? Um, and then there are two questions to, I think, um, to Winston. So discuss how to address the social determinants of health. And also, uh, Winston, you talked about resistance. Uh, what does it mean and how could we perform it? I think it was actually Wesley that talked about resistance, but um, I will leave that um, up to you guys to respond. In terms of the question about uh, whether female condoms were considered, we were asking, the questions were asking about uh, condoms in general. They didn't specify whether it was female condoms or uh, male condoms. Um, and because women made references also that their male partners did, did not want to use condoms. So specifically whether they were female condoms or male condoms, we, uh, we didn't ask that question. But, but I think it's uh, as part of um, supporting women um, in, in terms of HIV prevention, I think uh, bringing in uh, tools that are specific to women that they may have some, some control over is actually um, quite important. And female condoms are, um, are, are, are something that women are, are supposed to wear more than men. Um, so, and it's, it's also, as, as part of that discussion, also talking about, about PrEP uh, and availability of PrEP, because then women would have control over, uh, they may not have to discuss with somebody around taking PrEP, but that's a discussion that we can have. Uh, uh, we need to start integrating around our HIV prevention. But specifically, we, specifically we didn't ask what type of condoms people are talking about or responding about. So uh, there were two questions, uh, I guess, mainly for, for Wesley and, uh, and me about um, social determinants of health and, and resistance. Uh, I think that um, there's already, you know, and there has been for a long time, a very long time, so this is not new, a, a lot of uh, advocacy and, advo and activism in our communities uh, about the social determinants of health. And I, I, I use the term actually uh, st structural issues rather than social determinants of health uh, because, you know, the, the, the classic way in which people understand social determinants doesn't necessarily include racism and some other forms of, of, of oppression, but that is what I wanted to emphasize as well. That's why I said uh, uh, th those uh, structural issues. So this is not something new, but I, I, I think that um, in, in in, in the work we do, we haven't necessarily taken this up with the determination 
uh, that we ought to. That is in the HIV work we do. We haven't necessarily taken this up with the determination that we ought to, but it is something that we that 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 we need to return to. Now I know you know that um, Acho was birthed. Acho came into being in a discussion about the social determinants and about the structural issues. Uh, so Acho didn't just come into being, for example, about uh, you know use a condom and all that sort of thing. Um, so that's why I'm saying that in our work we need to we need to return we need to return to that. And I, I think that to some extent we have moved away from that. Um, you know, when Acho came into being with that kind of um, discussion, uh, there was no there was no real funding for the work we do. Our, our relationship to uh, policymakers and funders was kind of tenuous. And but I think that as as Acho itself became more and more. Um, uh, as Acho became more institutionalized in terms of its its, its ability to, to access uh, funding from from the usual from the usual sources and to, to include uh, policymakers and so on, uh, it it tended to move away from that. And and I don't think I don't think this is a this is a coincidence. And and there are a number of other things that happened uh, that I'm not going to go into that I that I think have, have been responsible for this in, in terms of we've lost that connection to the community that that was there at the beginning of Acho and it is something that we have to we have to return to because I don't think we can do this work just um, talking about condoms or just talking about uh, you know um, the, the usual things that we talk about without having really that that real um, informed discussion about the, the structural conditions that sort of circumscribe our, our, our livelihood. This is happening in other areas, and I think it is something that we collectively, not just actual, but collectively, uh, we have to we have to pay more more attention to. Thank you, Winston, for responding to that. So we're going to take at least two questions. One is from Lance, and one from Wangari. How can we balance the need for more culturally relevant, safe programs and interventions informed by prevention science and the need to critique and in some cases dismantle current programs and services that perpetuate anti-Black racism and create barriers to access to testing and other health and well-being services? What is the role of the OHTN, universities, et cetera, in this? And then the question for Garfield is, to what extent are Black MSM using PrEP? So uh, this is Abigail. I'll just say on my end, because I think that the work that I do is very closely related to uh, the institutional approach. Um, I think one of the key pieces is to maintain dialogue with the community, not just to not just on the side of informing people of what um, what the surveillance results are, but also in the um, design of of the process and in the interpretation of the results. So I think the M. Safiri study is a really good example of how um, how a collaboration can inform the work that we do in surveillance, where um, the surveillance data is really inadequate to tell us about what's going on in the community and that working with ACB researchers and doing, you know, a deeper analysis within the ACB community is where we learn what the surveillance numbers mean um, and that helps us inform how to move forward. Um, I think that the key piece really is making sure that there are the right people or that they, at least there are people in the room when these conversations are being held uh, and that the community has input into our processes here at the OHTN and also in affiliation with other organizations. So I have, uh, thanks Abigail for that, um, for that answer. Uh, and I think the other part of uh, Lance's question uh, is about um, balancing um, the culturally relevant and safe interventions that are, that are actually um, informed by, by, by science um, in relation to the, uh, to the mainstream 
um, uh, service delivery models that actually continue to perpetuate anti-black racism, uh, and it goes back to um, to the um, to, to the to the idea um, that I think uh, if we can all come together as um, you know uh, community uh, community service providers uh, working with uh, with researchers to actually help. Um, uh, inform any programs um, that are that are developed for ACB populations. We are actually uh, we actually have a, um, uh, a national project, and and Kadesi can actually say something about this because it's housed within ICAD. Uh, and we're looking at the uh, at the program science uh, model and, and trying to figure out how do programs that are that are that are that are developed for ACB populations uh, inform that model to ensure that um, any services or programs or, or interventions that are developed for ACB sorry, populations. Sorry, we're well, going to cut you short. Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, maybe in two minutes we wrap up. Again, I'm not hearing you. Uh, I hope you're hearing me. So in two minutes we'll be wrapping up and Katesi is going to Moderate that uh, two minutes, Wangari. Okay, continue. so I'll, I'll I'll finish what I was going to say, um, and and it's going to be interesting how that program science model that is tailored to the needs of ACB populations is actually going to look like. But it's an activity we are going to undertake uh, for the next two years to try and figure things out. Uh, and then we can utilize this to help develop services and programs that are relevant to ACB populations. Can I say you have something else to add? Um, not really. I mean, other than to say that, you know, program science, I think, hasn't really looked at population-specific adaptations. Um, so this is really work that I think is um, very groundbreaking and I think you know having a list of components which are not just individual um, interventions like I think you know a lot of what was alluded to over the course of the presentations is that um, you know black people Caribbean people African people need um, interdisciplinary multidisciplinary complex intersecting um, interventions that look at their lives holistically and not these silver bullets um, that you know address maybe one particular symptom. And so I think with the program science model that we'll be developing, um, which is very much in the infancy stages now, but I think um, it'll be really interesting to see how that uh, develops an actual model that aid service organizations and nonprofits can take up and actually become more evidence-based and effective in their programming. Yeah, so look out for that, uh, Lance, and probably you should get involved in it as we move forward with it. So I'm, I'm conscious that we are now at so, sorry, 135. Sorry, cutting you short. Uh, again, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you, uh, Katesi, for moderating, and uh, special thanks again to our lovely panelists, Wangari, Winston, Abigail, Denise, uh, uh, Wellesley and Garfield. Uh, please look out for more information and uh, thank you to everyone and goodbye from Toronto. <laughs>